Romance, as surpresas do gênero literário na nova era da literatura. Que fantasias um livro pode trazer à mente humana? Fronteiras do Pensamento de hoje apresenta a segunda parte da conferência O Romance no Novo Mundo, com Orhan Pamuk. O escritor e romancista turco analisa o roteiro de leitura a partir das expectativas do leitor e comenta como as nossas ideias entram em contradição com as do livro. Centro secreto do romance. Que pistas o escritor dá que podem nos levar até este nível de entendimento? De que forma a atmosfera do livro nos indica onde seguir na narrativa? Ideias. Como se relacionam os pensamentos do escritor, do leitor e os conceitos apresentados no livro? Com vocês, Orhan Pamuk. Reading a novel means understanding the world via non-Cartesian logic. What do I mean by Cartesian logic? In Cartesian logic, A is A, and there is, um, the world is mapped, and it's all understandable. And, and reason has one logic. Also, I mean the constant and steadfast ability to believe simultaneously in contradictory ideas. This is what we human beings can do. Um, um, too much imposition of Cartesian logic makes us miss the point that we can and we are, and we are doing this all the time, believe things that are contradictory simultaneously without too much worrying about this. Especially, especially this kind of thinking works when we understand novels about people who are not like us. Let me give you an example, perhaps, from one of my, er, um, 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 my novel, Snow. I wrote my novel, Snow, to explore, um, to look at the spirit of Turkey, the texture of life, this or that, through politics. I looked at the life of the nation, say, through art in my name is red, through history um, and other things in black book, through Istanbul again in black book, and in Snow, I tried to write a political novel. One of my uh, problems was to convince, uh, to be able to identify with, say, um, a political Islamist. I don't agree with po um, um, political Islam, but on the other hand, I want to understand it. So my problem is to be able to look at the world through a, uh, through a person who is entirely committed to politics and who is a strong belie believer in political Islam. I, thus, I wrote about Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalists, why I rejected his ideas. Novels are perfect for this kind of thinking. We read a novel, we look at the world through a person's point of view, while on the other hand, um, we disagree with him. We may entertain contradictory ideas as we read novels. Fourth thing, fourth thing we do, still we wonder, we wonder, is reality like this? Do the things narrated, seen, and described in a novel conform with what we know from our own lives? We want to, we read, as we read a novel, we are sometimes surprised that we learn so many things and we think, is this an, a game? an irony, a sarcastic point made by the writer, or is it fully truth, accurate representation of reality? For, um, um, say, when I was writing my book, My Name is Red, which is about 16th century Ottoman and Persian painters, I did a lot of research. But, um, I did not, this was not an encyclopedia of 16th century Islamic painting, while on the other hand, I was trying to get all the information rights. Novels, when we read novels, a part of our mind is busy with checking the reality, perhaps learning about a culture, a time, or a situation that we don't know much about. Another thing we do, we make, we pass moral judgments about both the choices and the behavior of the characters, and at the same time, we judge the writer for his moral judgments regarding his characters. Politics enters the art of the novel um, through this, that we are passing judgments. Is the writer agree with us about the character, ethics, politics of the um, situation? We, um, but um, um, radical politics or 
politics in general is contradictory to the art of the novel because novels are essentially novels work if we identify if the novelist identifies with the characters he is inventing if he or she sees the world through the point of view of his characters but if the novelist begins to pass judgment ethical especially ethical judgment on his characters then we um, we may be interested in it but um, the compassion that we need in order to enjoy will be missing another thing we do as our um, um, do is our mind performs all these operations simultaneously we congratulate ourselves on the knowledge depth and understanding we have attained especially in novels of high literary quality the intense relationship we establish with the text seems to us readers to be our own private success typical example of this is when we try to read james joyce james joyce um, when we try to read a hard novel a part of our mind says to ourselves my god i'm reading james joyce and enjoying it and and that gives and that also motivates us we continue reading that novel and um, as we read the novel uh, our own eye sees us reading that novel and that is also gives us a joy another thing we do while all this mental activity you know how what are they we remember we um, we follow the plot we try to understand we change um, words to pictures just as the writer change his pictures for for the words um, we try to identify with the characters we check the reality of the story we ask ourselves why the author is doing this why why the author is telling us this or that another thing we we should be doing all the time when we read a novel is to remember the rest of the novel while all this mental activity is going on our memory is laboring intensely in order um, in order to find meaning in the universe the writer reveals to us we feel we must search for the novel secret center and we therefore try to embed every detail of the novel in our memory the novel must be of a length that allows us to remember all the details we've gathered in the process of reading because the meaning of everything we encounter as we move through that novel is related to everything else we have come across in well constructed novels now um, everything is connected to everything else and this entire web of relations both forms the atmosphere of the book and points towards its secret center we search for the novel's secret center with utmost attention and this i argue is the most important thing we do this is the most frequent operation our minds perform when we read a novel whether naively unaware or, or sentimentally in a very reflective way what sets novels apart from other literary narrative is that they have a secret center novels owe these qualities and powers to the presence of a center somewhere in the background and to the fact that we read them with this kind of hope because they are novels as the novel reveals to us life's mundane details and our small fantasies daily habits and familiar objects we read on curiously in fact in amazement because we know they indicate a deeper meaning a purpose somewhere in the background every feature of the general landscape each leaf each flower is interesting and intriguing because there is meaning hidden behind it novels can address the people of the modern era indeed all humanity because they are three dimensional fictions they can speak of personal experience the knowledge we acquire through our senses and at the same time they can provide a fragment of knowledge an intuition a clue about the deepest thing in other words the center or what perhaps tolstoy would call and what perhaps tolstoy would call the meaning of life or however we refer to it that difficult 
to reach place we optimistically think exists. The dream of attaining the deepest, dearest knowledge of the world and of life without having to endure the difficulties of philosophy or the social press pressures of religion and doing this on the basis of our own experience using our own intellect is a very egalitarian, very democratic kind of hope. It's very common to say that no, the novel is dying, the, uh, the phone rings and there's a journalist at the other end and he's saying, Mr. Pamuk, we are doing a page, the art of the novel, the novels are dying, no one is reading novels, so forth and so on, would you, make a, a, would you please make a comment? And my comment, this is not true. Look at the numbers, more and more people are reading novels everywhere. Uh, in the, um, the classical novel, as we know today, is established. Leave aside Don Quixote, leave aside um, 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 atyp atypical examples. Classical novel, as we know today, was established by the generation of Dickens and Balzac and Stendhal in mid-19th century. More or less, 160 years passed. In this 160 years, pa uh, 160 years novels marginalize all other literary forms, essentially plays, journalistic writing, poetry. They are um, deeply marginalized. They are not popular anymore. I have a, my Chinese publisher in Shanghai tells me that he is receiving every day hundreds of hundreds of novels from all over China. I have heard similar, not complaints, but um, perhaps self-congratulatory remarks from my publishers all over the world. People are reading and writing more novels. Novels are the essential communication through literature. Anyone who wants to express himself, herself, is now doing that through novels. More and more poetry is being pushed aside. These are the facts and the art of the novel is not dying, in fact, it's getting more and more popular in our parts of the world. In what they call the emerging markets, new middle classes are appearing and getting on the stage in other parts of the world, and we are expressing, we desire to express and read more novels. It was with great intensity and this, with this particular hope that I read novels between the ages of 18 and 30. Every novel I read sitting, sitting, transfixed in my room in Istanbul, offered me a universe as rich in life detail as an encyclopedia or museum, as richly human as my own existence, and full of demands, consolations, and promises, which in depth and scope were comparable only to those found in philosophy and religion. I read novels as if in a dream state, forgetting everything else in order to gain knowledge of the world, to construct myself, and to shape my soul. I read novels to form myself, my spirit, to educate myself, to be a better person, really. And I, um, I was, let's say, in late 60s, early 70s, uh, that when I quit make, uh, when I decided that I will not be an architect, I will not be a painter, I will be a novelist, um, um, even before that, I was reading not only to learn the art of the novel, but to make myself a good person. And I was also aware of the fact that the more we read, the more we have, um, we can also feel the elasticity, the, how my spirit feels plastic, like a plastic in my hand if I read novels. On the other hand, reading a novel is not a simple thing. It, it reads all these operations we do in our minds. Um, we have to be alert. We have to be thinking, concluding, looking at the little things, little that, looking at the uh, colors, imagination, little tricks of their author. Reading a novel is the act of determining the real center of, and, and the real subject while also deriving pleasure from the surface details. Exploring the center, in other words, the real subject of the novel can come to seem much more important than these details. I'm talking, perhaps to conclude, I want to talk about this center. Perhaps we will discuss and you will ask questions about that. 
I am implying, oh, I also wrote this in my naive and sentimental novels, all novels have an open or secret center. We want to read the novel to reach there. To simplify this, I'll give you an example. What is the center of the novel? In a prologue, he wrote for Melville's Bartleby and the Scrivener, Borges, George Louis Borges, describes how the reader gradually reaches the heart of Moby Dick. Now I'm reading from Borges. He is reading Moby Dick and asking us questions. At the beginning, Borges says, the reader might consider the subject to be arduous life of the hunters, whale hunters, harpooners. Indeed, the opening chapters of Moby Dick are like a novel of social criticism, almost like a novel of John Steinbeck or even newspaper reportage full of details, as we all know, encyclopedic details about whaling and about the lives of harpooners. But then, says, the novel changes gear in a way. But then, says Borges, we come to think the subject is the madness of Captain Ahab, bent on pursuing and destroying the whale, white whale. And in fact, the middle chapters of Moby Dick are like a psychological novel analyzing the unique character of a powerful man filled with obsessive rage. Sounds like a Dostoevsky novel at this stage, half when we reach more than half of Moby Dick. Finally, Borges reminds us that the real subject and the center are something entirely different. Page by page, the story grows and until it takes on the dimensions of the cosmos. It is a sign of the brilliance and depth of a novel when there is such a distance between the narrated story and its center. Moby Dick is one of those masterpieces in which we constantly feel the presence of the center, constantly ask where it might be, constantly change our mind as to the answer. If one reason for this is the richness of its landscape and the complexity of its characters, another reason is the fact that even the greatest novelists the most disciplined craftsmen, the most meticulous planners, keep refining their ideas about the center of their novels during the process of writing. The novelist finds an abundance of material in the details of his own life and his imagination. He writes in order to explore, develop, and engage deeply with this material. The profound view of life that the novelist wishes to convey in his novel the insight that I'm calling the center emerges from the details, the overall shape, and the characters, all of which develop as the novel is written. Both writing and reading a novel require us to integrate all the material that comes from life and from our imagination, the subject, the story, the protagonists, and the details of our personal world with this light and this center. The ambiguity of their location is never a bad thing. On the contrary, it is a quality we readers demand. For if the center is too obvious, like in a detective novel, the center is obvious. It's, we are always reading detective novels to see if, who is the murderer. If the center is too obvious and the light is too strong, the meaning of the novel is immediately revealed and the act of reading feels repetitive. Reading genre novels, science fiction, crime novels, period fantasies and romance novels. We never ask when we read Agatha Christie our, ourselves the questions Borges asked while reading Moby Dick. What is the real subject? Where is the center? The center of these novels is precisely where we found it before. The murderer is the murderer. Only the adventures, the scenery, the main characters and the murderers are different. In the genre novel, the profound theme that the narrative must structurally imply remains the same from one book to the next. But there are also, of course, exceptions. Apart from the works of a few creative writers such as Stanislav Lem, Philippe K. Dick in science fiction, Patricia Highsmith in thrillers and murder mysteries, and John Le Carre in the, and, um, spy fiction, genre novels do not inspire us with any urge to seek the center at all. <coughs> novels are and, and literary novels that we aspire, that I aspire to write or what Ortega Gasset calls atmosphere novels, 
ask us the major questions about life, self-consciously or very naively, but novels are about asking these central questions. What is life? What should we, what should we do in life? How do others feel? What are the essential values in life? Marriage, friendship, loyalty, community, ideals, politics, ethics. These are the things that novels in the end should ask questions about. But now the center of the world is perhaps shifting. Our countries are changing. The values we have learned from, say, European fiction, in British fiction, American fiction, are, may not be our values, or these values may be universal values. The questions, as, as now literatures of our country perhaps are going on the stage, our humanities will be much more expressed, China, India, Brazil, all these countries will be speaking, their literatures, their arts will be speaking louder. We have to ask ourselves, who are we? Are we only our tradition, past, cultures, identity, or are we free citizens of the world? Are we determined by our troubled past history, or are we determined by our imaginations? Novels, I think, in this oncoming new era, should ask these questions. We should never be slaves to our history, to our identity, to what happened in the past, what our official histories, our private histories tell us, demand from us, and we should um, follow our imagination. We should not be slave to the past. We should realize, I think, and the novels should teach us that we are free men, our histories are only little part of our um, identity. What is important is our imagination, is our capacity to read, invent, change the world, look at the world with optimism. That is why I am writing novels. That is, I optimistically think, so many people, so many youngsters, so many enthusiastic people, by internet or by normal physical book, by letters, by newspapers, are expressing themselves to reach a readership to express themselves, to, un to, to, to evoke a desire in us to understand them, to go into their worlds. But when all this happens, our angers, our commitment to our national identities, our private identities, I think these are issues that are important, but when they are compared with our imagination, our power to change the world by inventing is so strong that for me, every time I pick up my pen and paper, I think history, although I wrote so much about history, is not that important. What is important is our imagination. Since I trust our imagination, I continue to write novels. Thank you so much. Você assistiu a segunda parte da conferência, o romance no Novo Mundo, com Orhan Pamuk. Obrigada pela sua companhia e até o próximo Fronteiras do Pensamento.